Hi guys, this is Erica from Team Protrusive. Jazz is sick with man flu and Ishan has chicken pox. Please enjoy this episode from the Ultimate Dentist podcast with our friend Dr. Devon Patel. And we will be back next week for a protrusive episode. Enjoy! Welcome to the Ultimate Dentist podcast. Join us to hear success stories of various individuals and learn clinical and life hacks to help you become the ultimate dentist. Hi everyone. So today we have the famous Jazz Gulati with us. Um, he is actually my mentor when it comes to doing podcasting and learning other skills. I've learned a lot from his uh, Splint course and uh, I would like Jazz to always elaborate on that as well. Uh, but uh, Jazz, I mean, th- there are very few people who doesn't, they don't know you. Could you please just introduce yourself as to who you are, what you do, and you know how you divide your time. I'm a guy who's wearing his scrubs in his conservatory, holding a Thanos mug. <laughs> That's who I am. No, uh, uh, Dev, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Jazz Galanti. I'm a general dentist. Uh, and I guess what I'm about is learning, sharing, and having a good time, making people fall in love with dentistry all over again, uh, and having a good time. And that's essentially my mission statement. Okay. And uh, so Jazz, uh, as we discussed when I started this journey, I thought you were the first person I contacted you um, because your podcast is really inspiring. This, This podcast, I want it to be for people who are graduated, who are whatever time in their journey, and they want to now up their skill and they're, they're looking forward to emulate or model someone else's success. Um, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to capture those people's uh, journey so someone can look at and, you know, or listen to the podcast and say, okay, you know what, Jazz did this, this, this. And in general, if you do that, if you put in that hard work, you do tend to reach that goal. But my aim is not to reach that goal in that time. Probably you reach your goal in 20 years time. I would really like to get some tips from you. So the journey is shorter for the newer dentists who are listening to this podcast and they pick up on things and, you know, they learn faster. So how does that sound? Deb, that's such such a great idea because essentially you're journaling. You're journaling everyone's experience and you're going to fast track everyone. So you know how they say, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants? Essentially, that's what you're doing. What you're going to be doing with this podcast, and I I can't wait to see it watch and grow, is helping people to be the best version of themselves in the quickest time as possible. Uh, And quite often when I've been recording episodes, you know, in the past, and the topic might be something clinical, but those five, 10 minutes we spend on the journey. That's always, I feel, well-received and people love to hear stories of, of others' experiences and journeys and that's what you're going to extrapolate. So it's very exciting to what you're doing here. Yes, because whenever I want to learn as well something, I see what that other person's doing and I, I mean, I cannot invent i mean i'm not that intelligent to invent a new wheel i'm just going to follow if someone's created one why should i invent another one you know that person's gone through the hardship and you know if you get uh, those golden nuggets golden points uh, so i probably reduce that hardship as warren buffett says you know learn from other people's mistakes you know you will grow faster <laughs> rather than learning from your own mistake that's a very expensive way to learn Okay, so uh, to start with, you know, why did you decide to do dentistry, Jazz? What what was your motivation behind starting doing dentistry? Mine's a very uh, clear one. Like for me, it's, 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 you know, some people like, ah, I don't know, I was Googling and this happened. For me, it's like I was 14 and I used to wake up look in the mirror and I used to have this upper left one because you know we're all dentists here we can talk about it upper left one which was literally so proclined this one rogue tooth right it was hideous it really put me in a down mood it was like a subject to bullying uh I hated it I was desperate for braces so that fateful day came I had braces and you know very quickly the teeth aligned right I felt the change in myself. I felt it internalize myself. I became so much more confident. I became the guy who you see in here now. I I think that was such a great thing to me. So I wanted to bottle that feeling up and give it to others. And then just the way that I was inspired, I guess, or the way my shackles were broken by 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 getting a, a beautiful smile that I was proud of, I wanted to be involved in that. And that's exactly the the, the path that led me to being here today. And um, so once you get into your, you know, undergraduate years, what sort of difficulties did you find? What sort of challenges you find during your university days? 
The usual stuff, Dev. I mean, dental school, I, I think, I guess when you look back now, it's obvious, but when you're there in the moment, you don't know any different. It's like one in like, you know, every day, there's only such a few patients you can see. And then of those, 50% of them will just not turn up their DNA, right? And so it's a very slow and frustrated learning experience. Some of those things that we learn are like, you know, le lectures, three hour lectures on waste management. And three hours is the total time you get to occlusion the whole five years as well, right? So like, it, it's, it's learning about shit that you don't want to learn about. I don't know if your, if your podcast can be explicit or not, but it's learning about <laughs> stuff that you just now don't want to be learning about, but you kind of have to do. You kind of, now it is, uh, you kind of have to. So, 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 so that was, I think, frustrating, but to be fair, at the time when you're there and you've got all these new friends and you're going through this journey together, that community spirit, I didn't realize it at the time. When I look back, I was like, wow, then school is so inefficient. But when you're there, it seemed like a good time. I had a lovely undergraduate time. It was good fun. Fun is definitely a word I'd use, all the memories. And you think of the all the non-clinical stuff, all the holidays, the elective in Vietnam, all those fun things. So I, I, I guess overall, I had a great experience, very social experience. But when you look back at it, you think, bloody hell, that was an inefficient way to learn. <laughs> yes. I mean, I always tell dentists who are an undergraduate that, you know what? enjoy, savor these years, sort of have an experience of different things because you will never be in that kind of environment again. Because as we know, when you come out, when you work in a real world, um, there's lots of fears and lots of, you know, insecurities you have and, you know, litigations and everything's quite high up in dentist's mind. And the university days are the time where you, you know, you can work freely. That's true, Dev. And I just want, I just want to add to that, that actually those tutors that we have when you're a student at dental school, they are the same tutors who do like big courses and stuff and they're ed international educators and whatnot. And then they're there at your clinic. They just sat there in the office writing a paper or whatever. Just knock on the door sometimes and you know, have a chat and, and ask good questions. And you're going to get that, you know, knowledge for free. Yes. So uh, put yourself out there. If you show an interest, you'll be amazed how these educators start showing an interest in your development. Yeah. So I think there's nothing wrong with actually showing an interest to that person as well. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I mean, I, I'm paying the price of not learning as much in my undergraduate because I'm now kind of relearning everything back again. <laughs> but it's, it's fun because you can put into practice straight away. That's the beauty of working in a real environment. So let's say when you finish your undergraduate uh, your BDS, you, you know, many people have different paths. So you have an oral maxillofacial path or going restorative, working in sort of a general practice. How did you decide what path you wanted? Were you clear about it or did you sort of hesitate it? What happened then? Initially, I was very clear, Dev, because my mission I decided that, okay, I, I decided that I didn't want to be an orthodontist anymore because uh, on those ortho clinics, I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what was going on. I wasn't inspired by the tutors I had in ortho. I was inspired by the restorative guys. And then also some more dental treatment that happened to me uh, in my undergraduate years. You wouldn't believe this. The ortho that I so highly praised that got my teeth fixed up was also the result of my lower uh, incisors, all of my lower incisors becoming non-vital, having huge perioral infections. Uh, my, lower, my lower central incisors being being cracked and having uh, being extracted. Uh, and now I've got three excisors, uh, one of which is a zirconia resin bridge. Uh, and so I've been through it all, <laughs> right? So I went through all that in my undergrad. Then I was like, oh, I want to be an endodontist. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I want to be a restorative dentist. So you know what? <laughs> it was those different touch points. So I wanted to be a restorative registrar, something very appealing about being shit hot at endo, really awesome at prosto, really good at perio. Like that was like the dream, right? You want to be a specialist and everything. And then when I did my DCT post in restorative, I'm so glad I did those posts because it made me realize that, okay, I don't see myself having a future here. I feel as though it's got the same drawbacks as being an, as an undergraduate. Like it's very slow paced. Mm -hmm. Innovation, unfortunately, doesn't happen in these hospitals. I'm sorry to say, happens in private practice. Yes. Happens in private practice. And then I realized that, okay, I don't want to pursue this five years registrar training. I'd rather learn through short courses, mentors, uh, one or two year programs, and then try and be good at all those disciplines and be the best GDP I can be. So that's how my sort of journey evolved from being very set in my ways about I want to be a restorative registrar to then accepting that, you know what? This isn't for me. Yeah, I mean, I remember my undergraduate. So if I'm if I'm posted on ortho department, I wanted to become orthodontist. If I'm in endo department, I, I wanted to become endodontist. If I'm oral <laughs> surgery, I wanted to become oral surgeon. So it's 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 difficult uh, when you come out 
what what would you like to do? So, and, and Deb, no one wants to be a GDP anymore. Yes. Right? You ask all these young dentists, they want to be a prosthodontist, they want to be a periodontist, yeah. they want to be a bloody public health specialist. Who who wants to be a, a GDP in our yeah, I mean, I'm GDP. You are a GDP, right? We we. I mean, I consider myself a GDP. I'm not a specialist. I'm not an. Specialist. You're a super G. You're a super GP oh. though, Deb. You're something else. You're doing curry place one day, then you're doing like uh, random other things. You're you're a super GP. You're like at a Lincoln Harris level. You're like super GP. <laughs> it's good because then it gives me flexibility, right? If you if you're doing just one thing, which is you know there are two different uh, thought process some people would say just you just need to do one thing to get good at it but my thought process if you're doing everything is like a good general dental practitioners then you can plan cases like no one else can plan because endodontists will only see canals and you know the teeth restore prosthodontists will you know implantologists will see things different orthodontists will see things differently but if you're doing all the disciplines and I certainly encourage everyone to start with there and then obviously find your passion and then, you know, funnel in and try and niche yeah, down. Exactly, niche down, but start with becoming a, a good general dental practitioner because that's that will help planning your treatment plans. Dev, I had a dentist shadow me the other day, right? No, dental student, you wouldn't believe this. I had a fourth year dental student shadow me the other day and he is, has placed an implant and he's, he wants, he's really into implants. Wow. He's, in, he's from Egypt, yeah? He, he's, he's a dental student in Egypt, came shadow me. A hilarious story, I won't go into, maybe have time at the end, well, I'll tell you the story of how he actually fell into dental school. It's actually hilarious. Uh, but um, I, I'm like, dude, slow down, right? You're doing implants, you, you know, you haven't even learned occlusion yet. Um, so I think there's, it, it's good to do everything, but there's a time and place for everything. So where do you think we should be just finishing as an undergrad? Where, where, where is that sort of um, standard? So I, th I feel um, what the standard after someone's undergraduate, finish undergraduation. Mm. Well, unfortunately, I've seen, I mean, I, I teach, as you know, uh, uh, postgraduate students who are, and the standard is not as good, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, at least the people I've seen, I'm not, I'm not generalizing, uh, but the dentists who I've seen, the standard is not good. And there is definitely room for improvement in doing general college dentistry. Of course, if you just want to do oral surgery, then that's fine. You know, but if you want to do restorative bit, then you need to learn everything to start with. And then, obviously, as you said, niche niche down. So, how was your first few years in in you know foundation year or you know whatever you did restorative post? How was that, and how did you then become more focused in what you're doing right now? So, the first paycheck I had, October 2013, uh, I'm I went on Gumtree and I bought a second hand uh, camera lens flash with my first paycheck to the extent that. I was emailing this guy to buy his uh, secondhand macro lens. And for some reason, because I was polite in our email, he thought I was a girl. <laughs> and then he was flirting with me by email. Uh, and then so I had to pretend to be a girl to get the best price possible by email. So then I took my sister to to meet this guy like 20 miles away. <laughs> and I, go, I made my sister go out and give the money and, re and bring the lens back. So 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 the lesson here is, man, I, w I knew I was, I, I was listening. I was listening. I was listening. Every bloody lecture I went to about career progression, the first thing they said was buy a camera, right? So it's, it's all good and well having knowledge, but I, I was like, I want to implement. Mm -hmm. So first paycheck, blew it all on the camera, basically, and a, you know, a few other things, basically. Uh, and then I started taking photos and photos and photos and photos, right? Like hundreds of photos. I had loads of batteries. I had you know, no stop of it. And they were all rubbish. If I go back now, they're all rubbish photos. But if I didn't go through that rubbish period, I'm quite proud of my photos now. Yeah. Very consistent. My, my quadrant photography is solid. I don't have any issue with occlusals. And that is such an important thing now when I look back at it in terms of my development. So, so first thing to do is I was very focused, take loads of photos, try and improve myself incrementally, go on loads of courses to the extent that it was a bit crazy how many courses I was going on because my philosophy was first five years out, learn everything and anything. Go to every free course, every section three course, every 50 pound course, the occasional more expensive course. And I just was like a sponge absorbing it all. And that helped me to then eventually decide where I wanted to go. Yeah, I think that 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 is really important because when you when you come out, you can even do fifty pounds section sixty three courses, which is really good, by the way. I mean, I teach in section sixty three courses, and uh, you know, I don't teach anything different because people are paying less money. You know, yes. so um, yes, exactly. They, I don't see any teacher who are teaching less because they are just delivering in a different way, different platform. You know, if you ask them question, they will always give the same answer kind of. So in the beginning, yes, I agree because you don't have much, you know, you, whatever, whichever course you go to, uh, you are going to learn right now. Our level is such that now 
if if we go in someone co- another course occlusion course let's say someone who is newly graduated will take more in because they they will have more to learn than us i mean for me when i go to course now i'm just looking for that small nugget i'm looking for that small mm, tip mm-hmm. which can sort of improve my quality of dentistry and and and, and the entire course will be worth that one small tip right you you find that it's just one tip you gain and it's worth it whereas yeah you when you're newer you have so much to learn and then sometimes because you have so much to learn it, it can daze you right it can be a little bit too much and then maybe you need to then you know, you might not grasp it the first time around, but that fourth time, you finally get it. And there's no shame in that, right? And um, so you you went on these courses. What I've found is that when I do courses, when I teach someone, my um, they all love courses, obviously. And uh, my aim is to make them implement that in their own practice. And that's, that's the whole goal when I do the courses. How did you implement? Because... The, the, the success of the course you're doing is not almost on the tutor. It's on you, on implementing it. So did you find any difficulty? Like, you know, most of the time people are like, I don't have this material. I don't have this instrument. You know, I don't have patience. Um, how was your journey in implementing what you learned in your clinical practice? That's such a great question. Uh, and uh, nowadays, you know, if you listen to the, the, the podcast where I, I talk about now, I talk about this as a, just a big thing about knowledge is, is useless without implementation, right? So all these courses, they're rubbish unless you can apply it. So nowadays, my mantra is, if you have a crown lengthening case, a patient who's shown interest, then go on the crown lengthening course, and then the next day, apply it. That's my thinking now. Yeah. But... I think like everyone, when I when I was new, man, I was going on everything and anything. It was all about breadth and not depth, which is the opposite now. Now it's about depth and not so much breadth. Uh, and so I went through it all where I'd go on a laser course. I didn't really have a laser or anything, or, or just to give you an example. I go on a microscope thing and I, I wouldn't have a microscope to use. And and you know, all the different examples you could think of, like I go on like a fiber reinforced bridges course. Guess what? I didn't have any fibers. Like, <laughs> but you pick up a few things, but yeah, I was poor at implementation. And so I wasted lots of money, lots of time, wasted on those courses because I didn't implement it. Now, because I was in my first few years, I don't regret Mm. it because it was networking. It was a day out. It was um, still learning about bonding principles, seeing what's out there. But definitely, I think a key lesson that we're sharing here is implementation over everything. Yeah. And again, um, so that's the reason what I do is I would have my course running six months earlier than the hands-on course. So people would start the course six months before so that they can find that patient by the time they do the hands-on course. And I think that's the key for implementation because I've done in past so many courses and I'm sure you have, have done, you know, splint courses where if patients, your, your students don't have patient for splint, they forget, uh, you know, that obviously your course is brilliant and it's online so they can go back. And that's what I try to replicate as well. Um, but, you know, that hands-on course, when you do that implementation, is the key. Now, uh, coming back to a different side, now, you know, you've done really well clinically. Now you are giving back almost a lot more. And how did your protrusive podcast uh, journey started? Uh, I know you described it a lot of times, you started with the group, but if you could, for my audience, go through that one more time. Um, How did your journey started? Okay, the journey started when I was in Singapore. So shortly where I left off before, I did the whole DF1, DCT1, DCT2. Then I decided, oh my goodness, I don't want to be a restorative registrar after all because it's not for me. And then it was like, what do I do? Do I enter the rat race now? Do I get a mortgage? And then that's it, right? You know, I'm, I'm stuck now. Or what me and my wife decided to do at the time was let's move to Singapore. Let's experience a new country. Let's go traveling the world. Let's work as a dentist in Singapore. So I did that. My wife got homesick, so a year and a half later, we came back to the UK to see family and stuff because she's very homely and whatnot. I bloody love the Singapore. I won't stay there forever. <laughs> so anyway, I came back, and then rumors started spreading amongst UK dentists. Oh, there's this guy. He went to Singapore. He lived a good life. <laughs> Call Jazz, and he'll tell you how much dentists will earn in Singapore, uh, what the language barriers are, what exams you need, how to find a bloody job, everything, right? And so but everyone and their dog had my phone number, right? <laughs> so every day uh, from London to Oxford as I was driving there and then driving back, thank goodness I had this long commute, I was on the phone to a new dentist. There's like a queue of dentists I'd call basically to just guide them through the same same story. So I thought to myself, bloody, I was knackered. I was like, if there was a way to record my voice and record this message to everyone and just send them like a WhatsApp message or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't that be great? A podcast. So episode one was expat dentist in Singapore. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, okay, this is this is fun. Uh, episode two was like dentist in USA because I had my uh, friend Prasma in, in USA. Uh, and, and then episode four was Australia. And then... It was me. It was like, actually, you know what? I'm not so passionate about 
dentist abroad, my real passion is clinical dentistry and geeking out. And I got over my imposter syndrome and started to just geek out and talk about all the things I love with amazing guests like yourself. Man, your three parts on uh, on Full Mouth Rehab and three uh, episodes, I know you get a lot of love for yeah. it. You must do. Because people come to me and I get one guy, um, Deb, you won't believe this, uh, Hamid messaged me. He said he learned more from those three episodes than he did from the in- entire Dawson curriculum. <laughs> entire Dawson curriculum. I'll tell you why. Because you have the ability to make things <laughs> tangible. Because I listen to your podcast and I learn more than some of the books I've read or some of the some of the you know courses I've went because you have the ability to make it tangible. You don't like wishy washy. You know, tell me what it is, and and I think that works really well because us as a dentist, we are we like step one, two, three kind of. If you don't like oh like a gray, we're not into grays, gray stuff. You know, it's better to have black and white, and mm-hmm. you're very good uh, in making your your podcast tangible to the level that you keep saying tangible a lot of times, you know, I do. It's become a mantra, you know, making dentistry tangible. Yeah. And I think it's a great thing because so much of dentistry a, is confusing, but then so much of it is actually simple, but it's presented in a confusing way. Yeah. So I get on great guests like yourself who made it tangible over three episodes. That was, if you haven't listened, guys, listen to Deb's three parts on full mouth rehab, uh, adhesive full mouth rehab in three episodes. Like we cover it in three hours. You'll gain so much from this free resource and you have to join Deb's groups on full mouth reconstruction for GDP. I had, uh, you know, I got my principal actually, John. I'm, I'm sat here in the conservatory recording with you. John's doing a, a, a virtual consult in my living room right now, <laughs> uh, and he he knows you. He's like, oh yeah, that that episode was awesome, whatnot, oh, and nice. he he really loved it. You made it really tangible, so everyone knows about your episode. Oh, perfect. And as I said, I think uh, I feel and I know it's it's because of you, Jazz, and it's not uh, back and forth. But I really uh, I am there, right? I'm the same person, but it's someone. It needs someone to extract that information out of you. Um, so with this journey, um, have you had any struggles? Um, I mean, what are the benefits you found out in your uh, podcasting journey and the group, uh, you know, created really uh, an environment? What are, what are your, um, you know, struggles? Because doing a good clinical dentistry, spending a lot of time clinically and then spending a lot of time on your group, on your podcast, um, burnout is a big thing in dentistry and, you know, um, I truly believe I remove burnout. I'm, I can only speak by myself. I, I, I deal with burnout by learning more, learning new things. Because I feel that people burn out many times is because they're just in a rut, as you said, just in and out. But how have you been, first of all, in that situation? Or you felt you know, a little bit burned out. Um, and how did you deal with that? Yeah, I, I have been in that situation before, two or three times in my um, short career so far, I guess, where I've really felt it because there's so much going on. At the time, I was getting married and I was a DCT person, so there was so much going on there. Uh, just a month ago, I was like, oh my God, I, my first ever full day occlusion teaching. I know you're so experienced at doing it, but for me, it was my first full day of, of content creation for that. And there was coming up to a live audience. I was getting this massive impost syndrome. And then two days after was a full another live event and whatnot. And that really helped me worked up and I, I think in both those times where I felt overworked the way I got over it is is a I used to believe that passion is the antidote to burnout yeah. but I, you know I, that can be dangerous and I, and, I, and I want to just say that you know I still have experienced it but it's been short-lived it was 24 hours and what got me over it was uh, my wife and my son and a support network and cuddles and just knowing and having some mindfulness and realizing that okay you know what that's done now let's take a breather switching off and then reigniting and going again, basically. So it's important to have a little bit of downtime. Uh, and, and I guess I'm in a situation now where like, I have so many unread emails, which is n- not like me at all. I have so many unread emails, un- uh, unread messages. I try my best, but I've accepted that I can't be everywhere all the time and family first, my health first. And then I always try and make time for, for all the lovely dentists who, who have something to share and I wanna share something with them. So it's all about compartmentalizing your time and, and, and you can't make yourself available to everyone all the time and realizing that that's okay. It's okay. So I think a big part of me having the energy and the mental capacity to continue to do what I do is realizing that it's okay to not have to completely destroy your mind and body to be able to achieve everything. You know, you got to look after yourself. So I think if you look after yourself, then you'll be able to then serve others. 
So how do you look after yourself? Do you have like hobbies uh, outside dentistry, which sort of breaks that stress level down? Obviously, spending time with family is quite important. Yeah, for me, it's cricket. I'm a huge cricket fan. I, I, I just, IPL just finished. I watched the final on Sunday with my dad. So uh, I used to play a lot more, but shoulder injuries, I play less. And I, I can't wait until my son, Ishan, starts playing cricket and supporting him and that. Uh, and then I, yeah, as, as cheesy it sounds, I've, I've always been like so broody. And when my son came along, um, it, it was the best thing ever. So I'm a really passionate father. So when I'm with Ishan, I'm with him. I'm not like multitasking or anything. I'm 100% present with him. Uh, and like I did this, me and my wife did this like uh, online parenting course, believe it or not, right? <laughs> and, it's, and it's amazing. It, it, the, the, the advice that this lady, Amy McReady, like she, she gave this advice that all you need to do is give your child 10 minutes of um, undivided tension per day. That's it. Bullshit. Okay, <laughs> 10 minutes is not enough. Okay, I, I think when I give my son 10 minutes, it's not it, enough. no, that's yeah. the beginning. I usually, it just doesn't work. Okay, so I tried that. It's like, no, I, I don't want to do that. And B, it just doesn't work. So when I'm with my son, I, I'm with him and that gets me through as well. So cricket and, and, and family and, and, and just, you know, watching my son grow up and teaching him things, which is such a, uh, a beautiful thing to be a part so of. So what are your future plans then? Now you, you are where you are. Uh, do you have any future grand plans? Uh, how are you? How are you um, imagining yourself in 10 years down the line, 15, 20 years down the line, if you have sort of planned it that way? Yeah, I think in my journey, where I am now is I'm loving being a GDP. Uh, I'm getting a lot of TMD referrals naturally, um, and I haven't really marketed myself to the public as TMD because then you really get overwhelmed. So I'm getting a lot of word of mouth uh, stuff and uh, referrals from dentists. I'm enjoying doing that, but I have podcast about this before, like, do you really want to limit your practice TMD? I don't know. I like doing uh, full mouth reconstruction as well, where, where TMDs may, may or may not be involved. Uh, I like doing my Invisalign. I like doing my general dentistry. I like seeing children. I like doing my general dentistry. So I, I want to, I'm at a crossroads where I think, okay, do I increase the TMD stuff or do I keep it on the on the DL and treat the cases as they come along. But definitely the growth area for me and the thing I'm learning more about is airway. Right? Oh, yeah. uh, learning more about airway, myofunctional therapies and whatnot uh, to be a more uh, holistic. Uh, and, and I'm just enjoying learning and growing in that. Um, and with the podcast, I'm just having such a great time there. There's so many great dentists uh, to, to interview and you'll you'll love the same with, with this as well, with where you're going with the ultimate dentist. There's so much fun to be had and people resonate with the energy people can can really pick something up and, and that really drives me so continue to podcast learn more about uh, airway which is such a fascinating area uh, and continue to enjoy the dentistry but i think the the thing i want to improve about myself is uh, make more time for important things in life and for me the thing with all the things that i do the thing that i've let down is exercise actually so so i used to be really into the gym and stuff so well, the thing i need to really allow myself to do is, is get back into um fitness and body health as well as you know all the fun things i do family uh, the part that's been neglected and i'm just being out and open is is my health in some ways you know this is this is funny because in the sense that i have also done that you know grind and all it came down during i was away on a course this weekend and all it came down to health because if you don't have your health, you cannot work in, you know, uh, 100 miles an hour speed. So, you know, it's it you, you do need you need your health besides you if you want to play long term game, because for short term, everyone can because because you're young, you, you know, you have energy. But if you want to do this long term, then so are we going to see more of your courses on splints and um, how um are you are you planning to spend more time on teaching or are you um are you still concentrating more on cl developing clinical practice referral base and everything I think a bit of both. I love teaching, man. I did my PG cert in dental education in 2013 as a DF1 oh, because wow. I decided at that time uh, nine years ten yeah nine years ago I decided that I want to have a profound impact in education in some way. I just decided it, uh, and it's just funny how it came to be. And I'm and I'm I'm hoping to make a dent in the next five ten years. But I, I I it's a part I really enjoy. So when I did my first full you know nine to five full day of teaching, the energy and the buzz like you know I wasn't exhausted. I was on you know I was buzzing at the end, question and stuff, sharing, learning. So it. it it's definitely something that excites me so much. And, you know, you've got to do what makes you happy, do what excites you. So, I th yeah, I do seeing that. Hopefully, uh, if people are there to listen and learn, I I'd love to um, navigate. But I think it's also uh, growing my clinical practice. Look, I have a, a, a situation where 
I'm, I can do bigger case and stuff, but I want the five and 10 year follow-ups. There's no shortcut for that. That time, you have to do your time and, and see your recalls and stuff and then learn because, you know, failure teaches you so much and the little failures I've had have taught me so much always. So I also want to be at one place for a long time to learn, learn, learn in my own. Uh, and so there's a combination of sharing some of the normal basic things, but as I advance in myself, if I can share that through a podcast or whatever with, with others and learn as well by getting a really clever people on, then, then there's so much fun to be had in that regard. Uh, agree, 100%. So when you are, let's say, selecting any CPD courses now, what are your criteria? What what are you looking for, for to do yourself? Right, so... I think there's a trap that some dentists fall into whereby they go on one composite course and then six months later, they go on a different composite course. And then a year later, they see, oh, this educator looks really fun and whatnot. And uh, they go on their composite course. For me, it's like once you've done a composite course, just implement, just implement, 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 take photos, send it back to that mentor, the educator, see how you can improve. I'm not saying that just learn from one person, one person only, but don't fall in the trap of just because you like composite that you go on every single composite educator, right? Uh, have a different, have some more strings to your bow, right? So, so have a different learning pathway of learning different things, not just one thing from various different educators. When it comes to me picking now, I know that I've done enough composite and I'm, I'm very much implying it. I'm not my comp, my posterior composites aren't amazing. They can be uh, improved for sure. But I feel as I'm a place now, okay, my patients are happy. I'm getting the occlusion right. Yes, they could look a bit prettier, but, 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 but that's where I am. So now I'm looking at, okay, where are the gaps in my knowledge, but my patient population needs? So I've got a very elderly population. Um, I'm doing far more crowns than I'm doing composite. So I, that's why I've really, in the last three years, I've, I've really gone deep into vertical crowns. I love doing vertical crowns. Mm -hmm. now, okay. I think there's so much beauty in that. Uh, and so now for the next course, for example, the next course I'm booked on 15th July is a perioprosta one with uh, Dr. Bilal Ashad. He's doing, you know, um, playing with the gingival levels or something I'm already doing with crown lengthening and uh, vertical crowns, but I want to get a deeper knowledge. I want to learn from him. So it's about what's going to serve my population based. Mm -hmm. What are things that I haven't been on a course on before mm -hmm. and how can I marry those two together? Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, your, your journey has been amazing and it's an inspiration. And just to sum sort of things up, um, if you have to do something different, let's say you, we rewind 10, 15 years back, uh, 2013, let's say, if you had to do, you know, now you're back knowing what you know now, if, would you do anything differently than what you've done now? That's a really tough question because I'm a big believer in like, you know, like you said as well, dot joints you, you can only, yeah, you can <laughs> only join the dots when you look back, right? You can only join them when you look back and you look forward. Yeah. So everything that happened is a blessing in the way that, okay, I am, you know, in a, in a practice, which is 15 minutes walk from home. And it's like lifestyle design, right? It designed my life in a way that, okay, you know, my, my, the, my son's nursery is behind my practice. My wife works the next 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 street along is my you know, my community dentist. Wow. So I am um, really proud in the way that I've done a, a life design to be in a situation now. I'm also working shift pattern eight till two, two till eight, which really helps in getting all the other things done. So I'm I'm happy with that, and all the things led to to it coming like this. So I can't really say um, I, I change anything, but I guess a lesson that I could pass on is I used to like I used to take out a tooth on someone, and then in before going to sleep that night, I think oh man, what if that patient's in pain right now? Or uh, I maybe would uh, take an uh, impression that wasn't very good. And in my, you know, before going to sleep, I'd be like, oh man, that air bubble in that impression or whatever, right? Bringing those issues that, you know, worrying steals nothing except the, the peace of today home with you. And then about when you're about to sleep, it's not a good place to be in your mind. It's good that I care. It's good to care. You should care care enough that you know you really show it but don't at the same time don't care so it's, it's if you got to find that balance right it's not you know you don't you can't own the patient's problem yes you still have to care as a clinician be a caring clinician but you cannot take that problem home with you so if i learned that sooner i think i'll live in a better place and it gets worse as you as you do i mean again when i do when i did my first two kuri plates i was like what if patients come back with the hematoma or the bleeding or you know you you worry a lot uh, and again when you do more complex cases the stakes are higher uh, there are more risk um, but that's because you care you're a caring practitioner you want everything to go well you care for your patient you care but then yeah you have got to draw the line somewhere that okay you can't then think about it and and, and dwell over it for too long but i guess you know what it, it 
also comes with experience. So you've done enough and you know, you know what? Yes, I know this. And also it comes with patient education. So now for me, if I'm worried about it, I'll tell patient. So then I know that, okay, you know, patient knows because many times you are worrying because you think that patient might be in a situation where they don't, they don't know what to do. So if I'm worried about, you know, hematoma or any problem, I'll say, look, this is Friday. I'm doing a surgery weekend surgery is closed take my mobile number all my patient has my mobile number i only have one number you're a brave man you're a brave man dev do you know what in this country we can do it <laughs> i just want to put it, i want to yeah i don't want to elaborate but here it's fine patients usually don't contact you unless there is a problem and i have to push them to contact me you know i said i don't uh-huh. wait until your review appointment and tell me that oh you had i don't know exposure of bone grafting or something like that because there is usually no pain so i would say if you see any problem call me text me better than emailing me because i don't go on email all the time so just call and text mm-hmm. so if i haven't received any text or call i can sleep peacefully because i know that you know things are fine. So I tell patient about dry socket. So if I take the tooth out, I tell them that, you know, it was a difficult extraction because, you know, whatever reason, uh, there is a likelihood that you can get dry socket, you know, um, you, you may be, they might be smoker. Having said that, I don't see that many smoker because I point blankly refuse to say, look, you know, you need to stop smoking before we go on to the implant or surgery journey. One of the way I found is just warn patient that this can happen. So the patient's Patient know, um, obviously they might freak out a little bit, but at least they know that this is one of the consequences. Right? Yeah, if you've preempted something and said that, okay, if you get this kind of thing, then yeah, uh, um, call me. If it's this, that and the other, then don't call me. Yeah, but yeah. Well, yes. So, I, I mean, my nurses are trained to pick up the phone when they call next day and, and tell patient patients, whatever patient says, they, the first thing they said, that's normal. And then they panic and they call mm-hmm. me and it's like, Dev patient. So, uh, but usually, <laughs> usually it's, uh, the first sentence is that's normal, unless it's obviously there is nothing, something abnormal because they have seen as well patients, how things goes. Because when you do big surgeries, patients swell up. And even though I show, I tell patient how big the swelling will be, they don't, they don't generally visual, be able to visualize. So I've started taking photos mm-hmm. of the patients I ask them, look, send me photo in five days time. Uh, and then I show it to, with that permission to other patients. So then they, they see, because in the beginning I was, that's a good one. Yeah. Because in the beginning I was worried about scaring patients, but now it's all about education. You just educate patient and, you know, yeah, and setting expectations. Yeah. The stress is less. Um, so going back to your journey, um, let's say if someone's just finished undergraduate, you know, they, they're now dentist, they're doing, you know, in doing a foundation training or whatever they call it right now uh, in the general practice. What, uh, and as I said, the, the whole point of this podcast is to speed up their journey. Can you tell us some golden tips, nuggets, which you want to pass on to, to make them more focused? Because I feel when you are focused, you can achieve things very quickly. More focused. And if you have any pointers as to you know, do step one, step two, make it tangible in that sense, in your own words. Um, how can we help them? Sure. The thing that comes to my mind straight away is, uh, and I'll name the people who taught me all these things. Okay. So James Gulnick, top guy in, in, in London, got a great campaign about kicking sugar out, fantastic dentist. He taught me to buy this book called Strengths Finder, Strengths Finder 2.0. Uh, and I did bought this book, I did the quiz, uh, and it gave me my top five strengths. So that builds self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And it's really, and, and there's a whole theory that, okay, you know, build on your weaknesses. But actually what that book argues is that you will go much further in life if you actually just focus fully and go all in on your strengths, you'll actually make a much better trajectory. So gain some self-awareness, figure out what your strengths are and play to your strengths in your life, in your relationships, in your career and everything. Okay. Number one. Number two is uh, what Corey Fran taught me in a DF1 lecture many years ago. I'm a big uh, fan of Corey Fran's. Uh, and he said the secret to success or the, the hallmark of a great restaurant dentist is, 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 is the trinity. It's three things, okay? It's magnification, illumination and photography. Mm-hmm. So get your loops, get good lighting uh, and, and take lots of photos. And then Lincoln Harris told me, take photos every patient, every time. Yeah. And if you take a p- p- photos, every patient, every time, you'll get you know, good, really fast taking photos. And then you get over the sort of the, you know, in, in, at the beginning when you take photos, it's like a big deal, like train the nurses, buying the bloody retractors, not knowing which retractors to get. It's a big deal. It's a big friction at the beginning. 
the sooner you can get over that friction, get those reps in of picking up the camera, getting used to holding it in one hand, taking the clues of photo by yourself, that really accelerates you. And the final thing I want to say, Dev, to really, really get everyone up to speed clinically as quick as possible is that if you want to, if you want to grow as a dentist, take photos. If you really want to grow as a dentist, show your photos to other people. That's when it strikes a fear of, you know, fear of God into you. And that's when your work magically improves. And that's where things, beautiful things happen. Even if your work's not so great at the beginning, just by sharing and getting over yourself and then uh, taking more and more photos and sharing, you will see, uh, you know, you look at some people's Instagram profiles who are prolific taking photos. Scroll all the way down to 2014 or something. Look at their photos then. They weren't as good as they were now, but they've been taking photos and sharing them since day one. And that's the secret to growth. And again, I mean, I like your idea of creating a group of the, the mess ups, you know, the failures. Because what happens is when you are a new graduate, when you see those Instagram photos, you think, oh, this is the dentist. This is it. You know, this person, I mean, they have learned it. I mean, I have messed up many times. Uh, I still mess up. And, uh, but those are the photos not being uploaded on Instagram. And uh, it gives you that illusion of perfect dentistry. But, you know, you, you learn. And, and uh, I think social media is helping a lot of dentists, but also you need to be a bit careful um, looking at person, how they portray themselves. Um, and that's why I really like your idea of creating that group um, where you post your mistakes because, you know, it, that's the way to learn. And if you haven't taken, I'll tell you initially, when I started taking photos, I would not take photos of my bad work because I was so depressed mm -hmm. that, you know, oh, this mm -hmm. is not a photo. But now... You can't bring yourself to click. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and my nurse, like, you didn't take the photo this time. Even my patient one time, I fitted a crown, uh, implant crown, and um, I told him, like, look, I want to change this crown. He's like, oh, I'm fine with it. Uh, you know, I'm going for a wedding tomorrow or something. I said, yeah, come back and we'll change it. And when he came back, he's like, yeah, I noticed that you didn't take photo of the, my tooth. Like, I've taken photo <laughs> throughout the journey. He's like, let's change the crown. I know you're not happy with it. I said, yes, I'm not happy with it. I want to change it. <laughs> I love how your patient picked yeah, up on that. Patient picked up on, patients do pick up because I take photos and I show them every time. So I always take photo pre, mid-treatment and post-treatment because they need to be part of that journey. So important. Um, and again, going back, photographs that I've, I have sort of seen in all the successful dentists, one thing which is in common is they all take photos. They're prolific at taking photos. If they're not taking, someone else is taking for them. So some of the people, they have nurses mm -hmm. who take the photos for them by the time patient comes in. But there is photos like, you know, that. And whenever I teach uh, any dentist, I tell them, like, forget about the loops, anything. Get the camera first. Because until else you communicate with patient, and patient said yes to the treatment, you're not going to be able to do that five point magnification loops on anything, right? So you need to communicate with patient. And many times I see cracks on photos better than in the mouth, you know, because you have, you mm -hmm. know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the amalgam cracks and everything. So yes, uh, it does really help. Um, so coming to a conclusion, do you have any Anything which you would like to share for dentists who, again, want to model you, they're looking up to you and they say, OK, you know, how can I improve my dentistry in, 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 in such a speed? How can it be focused? Um, do you have any tips for them apart from what you already shared? Really, really golden nuggets. Um, do you have anything for as, as before we, we come to conclusion? I could be boring and I, I could be boring and I say, find a mentor because like, you know, we've had that uh, already and it's so true. I, I'll, I'll let your other guests when you get on, very excited to hear all the other guests uh, say that one because it's an obvious one, right? Find a mentor and whatnot. It's so, so, so important. I'm going to go a little bit uh, left field and I'm going to say that you're going to have good days and bad days and it's okay and surround yourself with good people at home. Yeah. Family, friends, uh, and I've said this so many times in the last month or so on the podcast, but it's just my, my favorite thing right now. Yeah, life is not about the destination. It's not even about the journey. It's about the company. So, you know, you're the average. So when it comes to dentistry, you are the average of the five dentists you spend the most time with. You're the average of those, yeah, right? Yeah. When it comes to your, your personal life, that's who I need. When I'm experiencing burnout or near burnout, I really need those cuddles. I need that understanding. I need that TLC. So, you know, find yourself good people in your life and in your profession, and they will be your guiding light. They'll be your uh, North Star. Happiness is what you should focus on as a metric. 
And if you focus on that as a, as a metric, then you know it will just guide every decision you make. Well, thank you very much, Jazz. Before I let you go, could you share us how can people find you? Um, you know, if they if they want to, you know, reach out to you, what are the ways they can find you? Yeah, of course. Um, best place would be probably Instagram at Jazzy Gulati or the Protrusive Dental uh, Instagram page. You can check out Protrusive Dental Podcast. Check out the first thing you should check out because obviously you, you clicked onto Dev's podcast. You like Dev already. You know Dev. If you haven't listened to the Dev's three parts on Full Mouth Rehab, join his group. It's it's epic. It's so much free value being shared. There's also if you're then you know interested in learning further, he's got so many great programs for you to do. But just start your journey with that, uh, and then from the podcast, you, you know you're able to. to to hopefully pick up a few nuggets from there as well. Yeah, and your, as I said, your uh, Splint course is amazing. The amount of value you're giving is 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 amazing. So, and I I am I've done it, and you know I I've, so I know uh, I'm not just saying it by so I'm one of the one of the course delegate uh, of the online. I appreciate that, man. The, the whole the whole point of of Splint course was helping dentists. Like it, it's a bold thing about. TMD. I don't want anyone to limit their practice TMD. But I started to initially, uh, my, my mindset was, let me make a course to teach dentists how to think beyond the soft splint. But then I couldn't do that. So if it, if it was just that, if it was just splints only, the, I had enough content four years ago to launch the course because I had done low so many splints by then. But it's because I also wanted a dentist to make a diagnosis to be diagnosis led, to understand a little bit about the literature behind Broxham, literature behind TMD current thinking and whatnot, what the etiologies, management strategies, what makes good conservative care. That took me many more years to, to, to get it out. And so essentially, if you're looking to learn about TMD, yeah, you got it. But really, it's designed for that dentist who at the moment is just giving soft bite guards and they want to see another way, another option, whether they want to protect their beautiful veneers or they want to just find centric relation easier uh, or protect their dentistry from these uh, horrible pathological bruxes that are out there. Uh, there's all, the, all there's other uh, strings to our bow, basically, physiotherapy, et cetera. Yeah, also, uh, but also there's no good splint book. So, you know, um, you have collated all the information onto one plan. And that's really important because... Man, I would love to write something. Honestly, Dev, you, you raise a good point. I would love to write something one day, man. But yeah. time, time is of the essence. Yeah, no, I understand. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you will um, at some point we will, we will see a book uh, coming out to you. So again, thank you very much, Jazz. That was Jazz Galati. Uh, thank you very much. And um, um, hope, please, please follow Jazz and listen to his podcast. I listen to it. Dev, thanks so much. I wish you all the best, guys. So hit subscribe on the podcast. You have to hit subscribe so that you get the notifications. Hit subscribe. Uh, listen to Dev he's on something he's on something really beautiful here so support Dev and support people who are lifting you up who are helping you like Dev thank you very much Jess thank you how often was your jaw locking at that point uh, daily I would say multiple times a day or um, it could but at least once a day yeah um, worse when I wake up in the morning as well. Mm-hmm. well what kind of pain if any were you having before the gun um, it was just constantly aching like the whole right side, like the muscle was really sore, um, but yeah, and it just hurt to open my mouth mm-hmm. at all really. So anytime you open it would hurt, yeah. would it hurt all in one place or all over? It was usually just here mm-hmm. um, and it would go up, like when I yawned it would go up like above my ear. Okay, yeah. so how is the situation now in terms of locking and the pain? Um, it doesn't lock, I haven't had any locking incidents since, um, the pain is definitely a lot better if I don't wear the guard then I notice the pain in the back but if I do wear it daily then I don't have any pain. That's amazing, uh, so pain score of zero when you're wearing, that's pretty spectacular. Yeah.